Now set B is by far the more interesting. It's obviously larger. The length itself is 20 centimeters or 7.8 inches by 14 centimeters or 5.5 inches wide. We now have six individuals and a lot more variety. Now first up, we have another centrosaurine, the rather well-known Diabloceratops. There's an adult and a sub-adult. And here at least we have a better clue as to scale. Now taking the adult and comparing it to my dance dinosaur's Diabloceratops, which I estimate to be 1 to 20th based on a 4.5 meter animal or 14.8 feet. You see the size is rather comparable, so I'll accept the 1 to 20th scale. And comparing it to my trusty human, Diabloceratops means devil horn face after the Spanish Diablo, a Latinized Greek ceratops, and you can see why. These defining horns are differently painted, this time with a kind of brown-red hue, which is very nice. The textures are again brought out very nicely. As are the keratinized supraorbital horns, the beak, and even this little nub on the nose. As for the colour, look at this potpourri of colours in the frill. Now I don't know if the camera can pick it up, but going down you see all these subtle blends of colours that speak to many layers of application. Just look at the yellows here. And then segueing into the face and transitioning so smoothly into the nasal region. You also doubtless see the detailed sculpting. And even here over the nostrils, see how you have that very subtle soft tissue bulge? And of course, the very carefully painted eyes. And underneath, you see that texture. I'll just look at the folds here. And from behind, again, the frill texture. And whoa, just look at the detail in the base of the horns here. They've got a very cracked, lived-in appearance. Again, the fade up these horns. Then down the body. Again, the scale detail and those very lovely subtle blends. You see not just individual scales, but other tension lines superimposed on them. And here you see very faint, understated white markings down the model. And even these midline osteoderms have a subtlety in colour about close inspection. And of course, down the sides, that waterline mark. Just a beautiful, beautiful model. Then the sub adult, and you get more of the same, with characteristically juvenile features such as the underdeveloped horns. The frill colour hasn't yet matured, but elsewhere, this small model is no less detailed and caringly painted.
Then we have the really exciting Medusa Ceratops. Medusa Ceratops is another centrosaurine with an interesting history, initially mixed up with Alberta Ceratops. Like many Ceratopsians, it's sadly incomplete, based on incomplete skull fragments. Still, enough of it exists to show us a most unusual morphology, with these laterally directed epiparietals. The name Medusa Ceratops is, as you might guess, named after Medusa, based on these epiparietals bearing a fanciful resemblance to Medusa's snaky locks. And of course, Ceratops we know. Of interest is the specific name Loki. As you might guess, this references Loki, the Norse god of mischief, but has nothing to do with the Avengers movie. Rather, it refers to the convoluted and confusing history taken to arrive at its taxonomic positioning, which is fascinating but would take too long to tell here. Now, Based on the skull and a generic ceratopsian body and proportions, it's been estimated to be 6 meters or 20 feet. Again, here's my 1 to 20 of wonder artistic models humanoid. I'm pleased to at least have a representation of it because the only mass-produced model was from good old reliable Collecte, which I no longer have. And as you'd expect, the detail especially defining P2 and P3 are very good. Now just look at their sculpt and colour, even those little grooves. And delightfully here, just a very hint of that diminutive P1 that Chiba et al. 2017 proposed was missed by Ryan 2010, hence contributing to the Chasmosaurine versus Centrosaurine debate. Then coming down the frill, again notice the very complex blend of colour. Then the postorbital horns. Now let's go to the side, where you see the outline created by the rest of the epiparietals, and then the episcomosals. And on the other side, it just goes so nicely with the colour. And into the face now. Just look at that gorgeous eye wall. Again, not just individual scales, but the overlying textures as well. Ah, just really love the form of this cheat look going into the beak. I'm a bit of a traditionalist who still likes onetitians with cheeks and pteropods without lips. Aesthetically speaking, of course. Now down the body, and really by this point I'm sounding like a broken record uh, because I would be repeating my praise for the other ceratopsians here. Then one of the babies, this hapless little guy here, uh, looking cute with all his underdeveloped features. but once again, no less carefully developed in sculpt and paint application. And again, here's that almond. In fact, he's so small that even with my very small hands, I've nearly dropped him a number of times. And finally, we get to the ceratopsian I'm most excited about. This is the only chasmosaurian in the diorama, Spiclepius. And it's surprising that for a cool ceratopsian with about 50% of its skull, there'd be no mainstream model made of it. Not even from Collecte, usually Johnny on the spot with new dinosaurs. And yet still produced my favourite example of irrational exuberance here. Even the name sounds cool, very Roman. It comes from the Latin spica, meaning spike, and clipeus, which is a round shield. So both offence and defence in the same package. Estimated to be up to 6 metres or 20 feet long, um, so it's about the same size as Medusa Ceratops. And again, my humanoid for context. 
Unsurprisingly, it captures all the distinguishing features of Spiclepius. We have the P1 and P2 curling forward, um, rather similar to Cosmoceratops or Bagaceratops. The large triangular episcomorsals and the rest of the epiparietals. The dorsal lateral projecting postorbital horns. And all these have a different colour and texture to the other ceratopsians. They're very dark brown, appearing almost black in places. And of course, the frilled colour is different, and though applied with the same level of care. And as for the face, I just love the colour transition down here. Now the features like the beak, the eyes, again the detail in the sclera is just gorgeous. The underside, the back of the frill. And going down the rest of the body, it's as I've already talked about, high level of variable detail, subtle layer upon layer of colour to create complexity. Just look at these stripes. Now the base is the same kind of colour and texture we've already seen in the settee base, just bigger. Now we left this baby Medusa Ceratops for last because I feel it ties in the whole diorama. Now I've been saying I wish I had a full Sensen Ceratopsian and in a way this baby is a kind of cheat. And as you can see, you have the juvenile proportions and no less of that same detail and colour we've already seen. But the coolest thing about it is that it really lends life to this scene through its versatility. Now you could obviously put it here clinging to the mother. But just as easily, in the confusion of this potential tragedy, you could have it swept a distance away and then scrambling in desperation onto Spiclepius. or even hitching a ride on the Diabloceratops, uh, which, be careful, isn't as stable. The second set comes with the set B card. Again, it tells you the scale, the 100-piece limit, and the names of the dinosaurs. And weirdly, it mislabels Spiclepius as Stegopelta, which is an ankylosaur and doesn't even belong to the Judith River formation. I'm really looking forward to set C. Already, I've seen prototype pictures that promise much, and even gives my wish for a full Ceratopsian. I like the theme of emergence, and it would have been nice to have this too for this review, because I hope that all of us, wherever we are, uh, whatever we feel trapped in, will finally make it to shore and scramble out stronger and better than ever before. Now, this truly is a wonderful set. At first glance, it looks small, but each and every single piece, from largest to smallest, I discovered things to really like, in terms of sculpt and paint. The paint especially is commendable. Now, most models, even high-end ones, um, you know, I can see where they tried to cut corners wherever they could. But here, it's almost like the Sensen artists looked for every opportunity to layer on more complexity, while still retaining a naturalistic subtlety, without becoming vulgar. So that's it really. Now I want to thank you all for your support. I'm especially grateful to the increasing number of you who have an interest in the science parts in addition to just the model, judging from my stats. 
I couldn't be more delighted. So have a happy new year. May this year be better than the last. And I'll see you soon with another review. If I'm right, it will be rather unusual. Mm-hmm.